Greetings all and welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be jumping into another section of English grammar and the focus for today is going to be phrase structure rules. Yay! Everybody's excited about doing that, right? Today we're going to be looking at uh, basically all of the rules. We're going to do a little overview and then we'll focus on some of the more major sections today as we move down the chain, you know, from the from the sentence area as we move down to the more specifics into the other areas. There will be another video on um, a phrase structure rules, uh, so I'm going to be breaking it down a little bit into two different sections. All right, so the first thing that I want to do is jump into this whole idea of word order. Uh, language is always broken down into the order of the words, the sequence. It's very important. Um, in our language of English, we have the subject verb object type of sequence. For example, George lassos uh, the moon, right? Or I speak Spanish, right? Uh, yo hablo espanol. Subject, verb, object. That's the basic structure that we have. It's also probably one of the more popular uh, versions of language. Most of the Romance language, most of Europe uh, uses this. Uh, I believe Chinese and Hindi are also using this form. Um, uh, there are some variations when you get down into the more nitty-gritty, but your basic overview of that is that it's a subject-verb-object. The next uh, more popular one is subject-object-verb. <clears throat> um, subject, object, verb. Um, so there are languages that have the subject and then the object and then the verb at the end. For example, if you say, I speak Japanese, in Japanese you would say, uh, watashi wa nihongo ga dekimasu. I, Japanese, speak. And the I, I don't need to have. So what I just said there is a, I didn't uh, put in the subject. The subject would have been right here, which is the word watashi. I don't use it here. I can just say Nihongo ga dekimasu. Japanese can do, right? Japanese can do. Uh, so that's uh, the more uh, the other more popular uh, form. The least popular would be verb subject object, um, and uh, so parts of Gaelic would be would be this uh, speak I, uh, speak I Irish. Um, so those are the three major ones. So if you're going to be looking at a language that you want to learn, uh, it's always good to look for a language that has the same word order that you have. Okay, so if your first language is, uh, is Korean, it's probably going to be easier for you to learn a language like Japanese because the verb sequence is going to be the same. Um, it's going to be easier for me to learn a language where I have a similar verb sequence. Obviously, there are other things involved, but that's a major one. So someone who's, who speaks English and is trying to learn a language like Korean or Japanese, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them because the structure is uh, so completely different. Now, that's word order. That's one thing that gets entered into this whole process of um, understanding the rules for developing uh, structures and understanding what they are. Next thing you want to look at are things like the, some of the phrase structure rules. And these are just some of the general ones. We'll get into the specifics in just a minute. Uh, the first one is linearity. Some sentences require uh, an order of things because they're more analytic. Okay, so they require the subject at the beginning and the verb uh, at a certain place. And they require... Uh, you know, prepositional phrases to be put in particular order and put in certain places. Um, and so others don't. Others, like I said in Japanese, they don't even require the subject um, because it's understood or because the verb tells you what the subject is. So, for example, in Spanish, I don't need yo. I can just say hablo espanol. Okay, and in the context, they'll understand yo because that's I. The verb uh, the O in hablo indicates who is speaking, right? So you don't necessarily need that. Um, so that's linearity. There is a certain structure. Sometimes it's more defined. Sometimes it's less defined. Um, and then the next step here is the hierarchy. There are groups of words, not only in this sequence, but there are groups of words in the sequence. So there's a subject and the subject-associated groups of words, and there's a verb and a verb associated group, right? And there are there are uh, you know adjective phrases or adverb phrases, and, and they're grouped together in certain ways. And uh, so there, uh, though those types of hierarchies exist. And the last one is the categorality. Some groups also function as grammar elements. 
So you can have a noun phrase, okay, that actually is uh, uh, functioning, a noun phrase that's actually functioning as a noun or it's functioning as part of a sent, uh, you know, another complete sentence. And so you have this hierarchy down from the very, the order and then the group of orders and then the actual whole sections being uh, different, uh, different uh, components within. Uh, here, here's uh, the whole basic scheme of a sentence structure and the layers that are involved uh, with it. You have all these phrase structure rules that get dumped into the underlying structure. You have all the, voc the vocabulary that gets dumped into the structure. And uh, th these are the basic components as they're all put together. Now, uh, as the sentence is, there are probably mistakes or things that need to be corrected or adjusted because of the intention of meaning. So there are some movement rules. Uh, again, we'll talk about what these are a little bit later. But the movement rules are talking about um, uh, where we in English, although we don't do it in our heads, again, this is underlying, we move things around in a sentence, right? Normally, we would say things like... Um, uh, where are you going to? Well, to is at the end, and to actually belongs in front of the word where. And so it would actually be to where are you going? But we don't say that or write that in English much anymore. And so we have a movement rule that allows for us to explain how that happens because we take the preposition and we throw it back at the end, uh, which some would say is illegal, but it's still done. So there are movement rules. There are morphological rules. Uh, morphemes that we have to add or uh, stick on in order to make uh, this, this, the meaning understood. And that's why we can take a noun and make it a, uh, an adjective, or take an adjective and make it a noun, or take an adjective and make it a verb, because we're adding these morphemes as we go along the way. Other thing that we have to do before we get to the surface, okay, and the surface structure is actually what we see or what we say, would be some orthographic or uh, phonological rules. Um, that we need to be put in place. So, for example, we have the word uh, little, L-I-T-T-L-E. And we spell it little, but we don't pronounce it T-T. We actually convert the T to a D. And the reason why that's done is because the sounds before and after it are voiced. And so the T's that are in the middle, we now take the voice from the toe that are in between and we add voice to the middle. That's one of those phonological rules. Um, not, not every English-speaking country does that, but we do here in the U.S. Um, there are other types of those rules, obviously. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, but we need to apply those, and then we finally come to a surface structure. And so that's the layers that's going, that are involved here as you're trying to understand what's going on beneath. Again, we see this. This is what we see and understand. All of these things here are below the surface and things that we need to think about and ponder and try to figure out. That's what linguists do as they're trying to understand and be able to explain what's going on uh, when we try to explain the uh, syntax uh, of a language. All right, here are some of the more specific rules, and these are all of them that I'm going to be covering in the next two videos. Uh, so let's just do a quick uh, review here of what they are. This first one here is the sentence, and the sentence is basically a subject and a predicate, and there could be a sentence modifier. Now, a sentence modifier, again, I'm not going to go into that now, but we will talk about that later, but that's, that's basically this first structure. That's the top end of the structure, okay? At the very top, we're going to have some type of a sentence, and it's going to break into a subject and some type of predicate. There may be a couple other things that will be there, uh, but that's your basic. So that's number two, actually, um, is the, uh, the sentence and the predicate. It's going to be at the top of the tree. Uh, the sentence is broken down again into subject and predicate, and the subject is broken down into a noun phrase. Okay, so a noun phrase can be in the subject or it can be in the predicate, uh, or it can be, uh, you know, in the verb phrase, which is what I would prefer to call it, but right now we'll call it the predicate. Um, so that's the subject. The noun phrase can be a whole bunch of things. It can be a determiner. It can have an appositive. It can be have a noun. It can have a preposition. Um, it, the noun can actually be a noun phrase also. It can, be, it can have an adjective phrase. It can have a prepositional phrase. All of these things can be in that first noun phrase or any noun phrase. 
Um, so we also have uh, adjective phrase. Please note that it's a phrase. That's what the P stands for. It's not just an adjective. It's an adjective phrase. This one here, a prepositional phrase. Uh, we need to understand that phrases are bigger. We're moving down as we go here. So an adjective phrase can have an intensifier, it can have an adjective, any number of them, and it can have a prepositional phrase. So an adjective phrase can have a prepositional phrase. Just a pause here. I often talk to uh, students, and I should like to remind you, the difference between form and function. Okay? So a prepositional phrase is what I would call the uh, form. It looks like a prepositional phrase. It has a preposition. It has... Um, uh, a noun phrase after it, okay? That's its form. That's not necessarily its function in the sentence. What's it doing in the sentence? Oftentimes, prepositional phrases function as an adjective or they function as an adverb, okay? But they're a phrase. So when you're looking at prepositions, you're generally going to be trying to describe it in two ways. You'll say that it's, it's a, a preposition, but it's also going to be an adjective phrase or an adverb phrase. Uh, that's generally the way it's going to be broken down. Form and function. Form and function. All right. Um, so a preposition, then is go a prepositional phrase is going to include a preposition and a noun phrase. And again, the noun phrase could be uh, a complete sentence. Again, it could be uh, uh, another complete sentence. Uh, so noun phrases are big animals. They can be very small, but they can be very large. All right. The next major element here is the predicate. Okay, and the predicate is, uh, according to um, Grammar Rock, it's what, the, uh, is what the subject does. This is the tale of Mr. Morton. Mr. Morton is who? He is the subject of our tale, and the predicate tells what Mr. Morton must do. Mr. Morton walked down the street. Mr. Morton walked. Mr. Morton talked to his cat. Mr. Morton talked. Hello, cat. You look good. Mr. Morton was lonely. Mr. Morton was. Mr. Morton is the subject of the sentence. And what the predicate says, he does. Uh, but the predicate is basically the rest of the sentence. So you've got the subject, and then you have the predicate. Now, I would prefer to call this uh, the verb phrase, but we can call it a predicate here. Um, I'll, I'll break that down in just a minute. The predicate is going to contain the verb and anything else that goes after it, which could be an adjective, it could be an adverb, it could be um, um, a, noun, a noun phrase, a noun clause, could be any, any number of things. The predicate is whatever is left, whatever the second half is. Okay, so we also had have adverbials, um, which you can break down as an adverb clause, and a clause again is a subject and a verb. Okay, three types of clauses. I know four types of clauses. I guess you could say anyway. A clause is a sub. It is a is a is a, a phrase that has a subject and a verb. Okay, uh, a dependent clause is a clause that requires a main sentence to be attached to it. Um, independent clauses can stand alone. You have a noun clause, you have an adjective clause, you have an adverb clause, you have a conditional clause. And so there are a variety of clauses that we can look at. Right now we're looking at the adverbials, and so it's an adverb clause, or it's an adverb phrase, or it's a prepositional phrase. In all likelihood, a prepositional phrase is also going to be the adverb phrase. So, but whenever we have a preposition, that's just the form. That's not, the, uh, that's not the function. All right, if we look at an adverb clause, which is one of the adverbials. An adverb clause is an adverb marker, okay, and a sentence. Um, I use the term marker. I'll use it the whole way through here. Uh, a variety of different texts and books use different words to talk about this. They could call it as an um, um, adverbial um, subordinator or a, an adverbial... Uh, complementizer. I, I simply choose to use the word marker. Now, the downside with using the word marker is that marker could mean uh, a, a connector that connects two independent sentences, or a marker could be uh, a dependent clause marker. 
Okay, so marker is kind of general, but that's the one I prefer using. Anyway, so with an ad adverbial clause here, we have an adverb uh, subordinator or a marker and then a sentence. Okay, with an adverb phrase, so all we're going to have here is uh, an adverb and possibly an intensifier. So it's basically just an adverb with possible intensifiers in front of it. Okay, and that's the breakdown of all of the noun-based uh, components. Okay, all of these basically have nouns with them. Uh, from 11 down, we're now looking at the verb-based components. Okay, so the first one here is the auxiliary. Auxiliary verb, we call it. There are a variety of things that can be involved in it. You can have a tense that's involved here. You can have a modal that's involved here. You can have an imperative that's involved here. If it's a modal, it could be a phrasal modal. Okay, and I'm, let's back up here. A modal is part of the verb, is like the helping verb. Um, is, I'm sorry, yeah, like the be verb could be a helping verb. Um, can, may, might, uh, should, would, all of those can be helping type of verbs. Okay, now a modal is not going to be a be or have. It's going to be all the others. May, might, can, should, would, could, those, those types of things. Those are all modals. You could have a phrasal modal, which is using more than one. Uh, might have, for example, okay? Uh, which could be a phrasal modal. You could also have within here your perfect tense, right? Like I went into, I have gone, would be a perfect tense. Or progressive, which is B plus ING. We'll look at these more in detail later. All of that fits into the auxiliary. The other thing that would be in this area, and what I personally would put into the auxiliary, is tense, past or present. We only have two tenses in English. You get that? We only have two tenses in English. Okay, normally when you're in grammar school, you learn that you have, you know, six, eight, what are the three, nine or twelve tenses. Uh, but in point of fact, we only have two tenses. Tense here is defined as how the verb itself, the main verb itself, can be formatted. It can be formatted in present or it can be formatted in past. The only other way that we get things like future or conditional is by adding extra words to it. And so that's not technically a tense. Uh, again, now let's jump down here to the perfects and the progressives. I think I ran into those already. You're perfect in your past uh, times. Um, and those are all the basic structures. We will look at these in detail from here on out. All right, let's take a look at your sentence. Okay, that's the thing that sits at the top. Uh, you've got a sentence modifier, so you've got the sentence, and then you're going to break down into a little uh, thing that looks like this as you begin your tree. You've got a sentence at the top, and then it breaks down into subject and, and predicate. Um, so in your sentence, you've got a sentence modifier, subject, and predicate. It looks like that. Uh, you could have... Uh, uh, this, is a, this is just a more detailed breakdown I think I'm looking at here. You have your sentence again. You can have multiple uh, uh, sentences here as you go down through your noun phrase structures. Anyway, your subject is going to have a noun phrase. It could have a determiner. It could have an uh, and a positive. It could have an adjective phrase. Um, it could have, uh, I'm sorry, it will have a noun. Uh, noun can be singular or plural, and it could have a preposition. So this is basically how that noun phrase could be broken down just in terms of notation. Uh, you're going to want to use these notations as you move forward, okay? And as you break things down, so let's just say you have your, your, uh, your well, we'll see that, and we'll see that as we go forward. So here's an example uh, of a little more detail, right? We're looking at number five here, which is an adjective phrase. An adjective phrase can have an intensifier, can have an adjective, can have a prepositional phrase. It will have a preposition, and it will have some type of noun phrase. Here's the basic structure, right? Here's a sentence. We break it down with lines drawing out, and we can have a, um, what is this here? We can have the subject, which is broken down here, right? The road curves around the mountain, right? So here we've broken it down. We've got sentence, subject, noun phrase, which is broken down into here. We have your predicate, okay? Now, I'm breaking this down a little bit differently. I like to separate the verb phrase structure, which is this right here, okay? I like to separate this from the rest of the, uh, from the, rest of the uh, predicate. Uh, some texts like to put this predicate section, they like to move it and put it in here. 
okay, as part of the verb phrase. I do not like to do that. I see them as separate entities, although I do recognize that all, uh, all of these elements around the mountain is actually describing the verb, and that's why they want to put it in there. I prefer to keep it separate um, just because in my head I don't see it directly being the verb. It's something that, that uh, uh, impacts or addresses the verb, but it's a separate entity. That's how I look at it. I will not uh, complain if you want to do it either way because you'll find research out there that looks at both sides. All right, so we've got a predicate and then we have a verb phrase. The verb phrase is broken down into the main verb and the auxiliary. Of course, the auxiliary can be broken down into a variety of things, as you saw before. It can be broken down by tense or by um, um, modals. Uh, or by negative, which we haven't talked about yet, but negative would go in here as well. So there are a variety of things that go into the auxiliary. For us, we just have one word here, curves, and then we have a prepositional phrase around the corner. Note, prepositional phrase. And then, of course, that prepositional phrase is functioning as an adverb. It's describing how um, the road curves. It's describing the curving of the road, okay? Um, and then, of course, within the prepositional phrase, you have a preposition, noun phrase. The noun phrase is broken down into a noun and its determiner. Okay? That's just a basic structure. You have to walk through it the first time here. Yay! Noun phrase. Noun phrase, again, is going to be broken down into determiner, adjective, noun, prepositional phrase. So here's an example. Here's a uh, noun that has three determiners. All his own music. And apparently the max is three. You can have a, an adjective before the noun, right? Uh, so, for example, a very loud noise, okay? Very loud is describing noise. You can have a preposition after the noun phrase, a tale of woe. Um, of woe is your prepositional phrase. Okay? It's acting as an adjective in this case. So, variety of things that you can use noun phrases for. They can be a subject, they can be an object, they can be... Um, an indirect object, they can be a direct object, or they can be the object of a preposition. Um, okay, noun phrases can also be separate sentences, but of course they would function in one of those areas over there as, as we just described. Let's take a look at another example as we try to move into the adverb sections. Um, here's an adverb clause, the music ended. This is the main sentence. We got that? The music ended, subject, verb. Before, marker. Okay, this is a marker for a dependent adverbial clause. So we've got a marker, and then we have another sentence. Jim arrived, subject verb, at the stadium. Okay, let's break this down. Okay, here's another, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, that's the first one, and that's the one we're going to look at. We can all, well, let's look at it first. We've got subject, we've got sentence, and that breaks down to subject and predicate. And the subject is now broken down to a noun phrase. The music, determiner noun. That was a piece of cake. Your predicate is now broken down into a verb phrase and an adverb clause. Okay. Again, I this can be placed under underneath uh, like this, but I'm not going to do that because I like to keep them separate. I like the verb phrase to have its own branch. So we've got a verb phrase and then a main verb phrase ended. Okay. And then off of the, your predicate here, I'm going to have an adverbial clause. Okay, and the adverbial clause is going to begin with a marker or an adverbial subordinator, depending on what you want to call it. I'll call it a marker. Um, and that's the word before. And then off of the adverb clause, we have a whole new sentence. This is sentence two, to be honest. Um, okay, this is sentence two, not, not the main sentence. Okay, and so the sentence has, what does it have? You know, subject predicate. So we've got subject predicate. We've got a subject, which is a noun phrase. I could have put that in here, a noun phrase. And um, it's just a noun. I have a predicate, which has a verb phrase and a main verb, which is arrived. It also has an adverbial phrase. What's the adverbial phrase mean? That's the function. Okay, and then the form is what? Well, it's a preposition. Okay, uh, and the uh, preposition begins with at, and then the, the main noun is the stadium. I can break this down as well, the being a determiner and stadium being the noun. Okay, so that's going to be this adverb clause. Well, it could just be an adverb phrase. The music sounded very southern. Okay, and that's how the sound was. So this, the first part's going to be the same, right? But then very southern is just now going to be an adverb phrase off of the predicate, and you break it down, intensifier adverb. 
Jim parked the car away in the shade. Away in the shade? Away from the shade? I, that's kind of odd. Away in the shade. Well, let's deal with it. Jim parked. Okay, that's your main sentence. Subject, verb, parked. The car is now going to be a noun phrase. Okay, and the noun phrase is going to include away in the shade, which is describing where the car was parked. Okay, um, which would be an adverb. I'm sorry, it's not an adjective. That's going to be an adverb phrase. Um, this one would be. We're not going to break it down now, obviously, but I did want to show you that you can have in your adverb phrase, you can have um, a clause, a phrase, and then a preposition. Oh, we've got even two more over here for 9 and 10. Your adverb clause is broken down into a sentence, which I showed, and the same thing with your adverb phrase. Okay? A um, lot to, to dig in here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, another example that children walked very slowly to the bus stop. Okay, and so we've got uh, the children, that's your subject, and it's broken down into a noun phrase. Determiner, the children, the, the noun phrase is children. You got your, off of your predicate, you've got your main verb. Main verb off of your, uh, which is a, the verb phrase, walked. That's the whole verb. And then we've got two um, adverb phrases. Okay, walked very slowly, that's an adverb phrase, that's one of them. And slowly, again, this is describing walked, okay? And then very is an intensifier. And then the other one is to the bus stop. This is where they walked. Again, it's another adverb phrase, so we make another adverb phrase. And again, remember, adverb phrase, what are these? These are functions. The forms are actually, for this one, is a preposition. The form for this one is just a straight adverb. All right, so we've got the difference between form and function. And then, of course, to the bus stop breaks down into a prepositional phrase, which has a preposition and a noun phrase, the bus stop. Um, okay, so that's how that looks. Let's take a look at some um, final adverbials here. There are different ways uh, of looking at adverbials. You have adverbials of manner, how someone walked. Adverbials of direction, where they walked, right? The direction, right? Um, a position. Jahan is home. That's where he is. Okay, it's describing uh, the position. Oh, we can do that. Sheldon sleeps every day at 11. Okay, at 11 is describing when he sleeps. Frequency, always. Purpose, how he eats to live. I live to eat. Well, I don't think that's actually true, but um, you see how this is the purpose, right? For the purpose of. It's a prepositional uh, convert combined into uh, an, in, an infinitive here, but it's describing why or how they eat slash live, right? And the reason. Tom pulled over because. That's an adverb of reason, okay? You also have some adverbial sequencing. These aren't, uh, the, the, uh, by the way, some of, you know, some of these uh, reasons can be full-fledged uh, clauses, like this one that we see here at the bottom. Some can just be a word or two or a phrase or two. But when we're dealing, especially with things that are like just phrases, um, there's an order for them uh, when you put in adverbias. You can, you can string them along, but they have to be stringed along in the proper order. And this is generally the way it goes. We have direction first and then manner. Manner and then position. Sometimes they can be switched and sometimes they can't. Time frequency. Time uh, frequency tends to follow direction, manner, and position. So in other words, time is generally in the middle. Purpose and reason tend to be last. And please note here the word tend. Okay, how in the world did we find out that time is more is in the middle or reason is it is last? The reason why is because they went out and they analyzed all these different sentences to try to find out which order they were in. Because there are some countries, some languages that other people have when they come here to learn English, they put them in the wrong order. Quote on, well, they put them in the wrong order. Why? Because in their language, that's the order they put them in. Um, or they don't have uh, any rules for putting them in. And so they may have problems with the, the sequencing of orders, right? Um, so, you know, just for an example, uh, let me jump into adjectives here. Um, uh, the big red ball, okay? The big red ball is on the table. Well, I can say the red big ball is on the table, but it sounds funny. It doesn't sound right. Why? Because size typically goes before color, right? Um, the big blue house, right? Well, the blue big house, that's just, that, that's just not right. There's something wrong with that. Why? Because there's a particular order. 
Um, and the same it is with adverbial uh, sequencing. And that's all I have for this particular session. I do thank you for stopping by. If you do have questions or comments, shoot them down below. And I look forward to uh, seeing you again the next uh, installment here of, um, uh, of Phrasal Verbs. Bye-bye now.